I'd like now to introduce to you Dr. K. Redfield Jameson. Dr. Jameson is professor of psychiatry at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is co-director of the John Hopkins Mood Disorder Center. Please give a warm San Diego welcome to Dr. Jameson. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm particularly delighted to be here with the California Bipolar Foundation, a young foundation which has a thousand advantages in terms of not being entrenched and full of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed uh, motivated people. Bipolar illness tends to motivate people. Anyone who has this illness, I have this illness. I've had it for since I was 17 years old. Um, I was pretty much devastated by it, um, as have been many members of my family. I decided to study it and to try and learn as much about the illness as I could to do research on it and to teach about it and to advocate for it. Uh, this foundation is based on parents who have children with bipolar illness. And again, it is particularly devastating for family members and because of all sorts of related problems, the suicide rate is very, very high. Alcoholism and drug abuse are very common, and the illness itself is, uh, can be quite frightening to be around. So this evening, I'm going to be talking about some of the positive aspects of bipolar illness, of what I, I would call manic depressive illness or bipolar illness. So I'm going to be focusing on some of the positive aspects of the illness, but I would like to put it in the context of, first and foremost, this is a potentially lethal disease. I've given way too many eulogies for people who have died by suicide, spoken to way too many parents who have had suicide in their children, and I myself nearly died from this illness and was in a coma for many days. So I don't take this uh, disease lightly. I don't romanticize it. It's a terrible disease, but it's an interesting disease. Robert Lowell, arguably the great American poet of the 20th century, was hospitalized about 20 times for his manic depressive illness. And he addressed this point of it's being a magical orange grove in a nightmare. And again, I would say that overwhelmingly as a clinician and as a researcher and as a patient, that this is a nightmare of a disease. But there is this magical orange grove, and it's been observed for thousands of years that there is a relationship between, quote, madness and artistic creativity. So this evening, I'm going to be talking about this relationship, uh, what we know about it, how often it occurs, why it might occur, and what are the clinical implications of it. So I'm going to pass on some of these things uh, because they're for more, uh, for more technical discussion, but I, I th you can basically look at the relationship between bipolar illness and depression and creativity in several ways. One is by doing biographical studies, retrospective studies of people like Van Gogh, people like Lord Byron, and so forth. It's a risky business. Uh, it's speculative. Some people will probably do it a little bit more systematically than others. You don't want to be labeling people as manic depressive, who in fact are people who are just a bit moody broody or artists. Uh, and the wonderful thing about bipolar illness is that we know a lot about it. We know a lot about the science of it. We know a lot about the, uh, how it presents itself. Hippocrates described it 2,500 years ago very well. Uh, we know a lot about the natural course of the illness, how it distributes itself over time. And we know overwhelmingly and most importantly that it's a genetic illness. It runs in families. So you can go back and, and look at people's lives in that context. Then you can do studies of people who are living artists and writers and look at do they have rates of depression and bipolar illness that are higher than the rest of the population. And it turns out in study after study after study, there are elevated rates of both depression and bipolar illness across groups of highly creative people. Um, I mean, all of you will know, uh, it, it, there's nothing probably more intrinsically boring than diagnosis in some ways, but 
Uh, I'd just like to emphasize that, again, when you're talking about the diagnosis of bipolar illness, you're not just talking about somebody having a problem with moods. It's a syndrome of behaviors, of disturbed sleep, of disturbed energies, of changes in cognitive functioning, the ability to think, the ability to reason. Um, and it's not just mood. Um, and you're looking at it over a particular period of time. How long does it last? How severe is the problem? And you have to rule out other causes. The, for example, thyroid disease can present at times looking very much like um, bipolar illness. So one of the things that you can do, if you're doing a biographical, trying to do a biographical diagnosis, one of the things that you can do is look at the natural course of the disease. You can say, at what point did this first person, at what point did Van Gogh first get ill? Uh, was it in his family? Was it episodic? Was it chronic? Um, how long did it last? And what's the long-term course? Because we know a couple of things about bipolar illness over time. First of all, we know it's a progressive disease. If it's not treated aggressively and accurately well, it will have a tendency to progress. It will get worse. The episodes will become more frequent. Um, and people who have it are far more likely than with any other illness to kill themselves. So we know that um, bipolar illness, manic depressive illness, is fundamentally an illness of youth. It first hits in young people. Unlike heart disease, unlike cancer, it's one of the things that makes this illness particularly awful, uh, is that it l l uh, lasts a lifetime, doesn't go away unless it's treated. And so what you can see is the peak distribution, but people tend first to first become ill around the age of 18, um, 18, 20, um, so forth. So if, some, if, if you're doing biographical studies and people are first getting ill, around that time period is one little piece of data. Not, not compelling, but it's one little piece of, of information. We also know that it is an episodic illness, and we know that it's often seasonal. Um, for when I did a study in, in Britain several years ago of the leading artists and writers there, one of the things that was very clear, and which is clear in other studies as well, is that many writers and artists will produce on a regular basis. If they're going to write 500 words a day, they write 500 words a day. But about a significant percentage of those people will write very episodically. They may write everything they're going to write in three months or two months. Um, so you look at those people. You look at those people who have very episodic patterns and much more consistent with a mood disorder, with depression or bipolar illness. It, and likewise, if there are changes in other aspects of their behavior, they're spending more money, they're going out more, they're drinking more, um, and so forth. So this is a study that was done uh, several years ago by a British psychiatrist looking at the pro uh, productivity of Robert Schumann, for example, over his lifetime. And what they found uh, was that he, in fact, when he was manic, uh, he was much more productive, or hypomanic, mildly manic, he was much more productive over time. And those years in which he was depressed, he produced very little. This is not exactly counterintuitive, but it's an interesting way of, of kind of graphing people's productivity over time as a function of their mood state. And you can see here at the end of his life, he attempted suicide, and he actually spent the last two and a half years of his life in an insane asylum. Uh, Van Gogh, you can see again, he first became ill when he was in his teens, very consistent with bipolar illness. Um, and what you see here is an example of the progressive nature of the disease. Uh, it was untreated. and that as he got older and as time went by, he had more and more episodes culminating in the last two or three years of his life when he spent much of his time in an insane asylum and then eventually killed himself. 